There are some foundational skills that are necessary to succeed in the land business. One of them is talking on the phone. Let's face it, talking to complete strangers, many of whom are not particularly happy with the offers you sent them, can be about as much fun as having a tooth pulled without anesthesia. But if you master this one skill, it can lead to hugely profitable deals. On this episode of the Land.MBA podcast, Dave and I go deep on the first call after you send your mail. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Land.MBA podcast. This is David Van Steen, Kiss, your co-host, and I'm here with my co-host, Howard Zonder. How are you today, buddy? Fantabulous, as always, another day in paradise up here in Connecticut. All right, awesome, awesome. Hey, uh, before we get started, people watching on YouTube, please hit that like button, subscribe, make a comment, write a review. We really appreciate it. And those listening, whatever channel that you're listening on, please don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and do all that stuff. It really helps us to rank higher in the algorithms and to uh, pro- keep providing you this uh, this good content. And uh, we really, really appreciate uh, our, uh, our listeners and subscribers, and uh, we hope that uh, you appreciate the content we're delivering. So very good. What are we talking about today, Howie? We are going to get on the phone. <laughs> so when I think about the business... You know, there's just a few things you just have to master in this business, some basic skills. And if you master those basic skills, you're going to do well. One is you got to learn to be good with data. The second thing is you got to learn to be good on the phone. You might also want to master some of the legalities of the business. Can't hurt, right? You know, the process and all that. But right. uh, those two fundamental skills, data and phone, are absolutely critical to success in this business. And they are both, you know, can be mastered with practice. You don't have to be born to it. Um, But uh, if you do those things well, you will succeed. And from what uh, I have seen, um, just working with so many people um, in the last four or five years, is that people coming into the business, certainly at the beginning, are very uncomfortable on the phone talking to strangers. And and I certainly understand that. Um, uh, not necessarily for myself, because, you know, I just talk, you know, I'm a talker. So I'll, I'll talk to anybody. Um, uh, but I can, I know that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with that, especially if they don't feel like they have mastered what's supposed to happen or what they're supposed to say, or they have to, you know, shoot from the hip. Not everybody is a shoot from the hip kind of person. A lot of people, you know, re, you know, require preparation and, uh, and, and, and that kind of uh, confidence that goes in with that preparation. So, Today, what we're going to cover is what happens. I've sent out all my letters, thousands of letters out the door, and all of a sudden, my phone is ringing. What do I do? How do I handle that conversation? And the oh not, shit moment. I yeah, got the oh shit callers. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully, by the end of this podcast, we're going to provide enough structure and preparation so that when you get on that call, you are going to be ready to rock and roll and turn that into lots of good deals that's right that's right but yeah. before david what is going on over there are you like are you in a studio what is what's that checkerboard behind you no it's just uh acoustics for the wall i uh, recently moved into uh, a new house and my basement uh is not uh, completely finished so there's a lot of hard surfaces so i'm just uh, dampening the echo how, how do I sound, by the way? You sound good, 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 good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm about I can't think there. of a more appropriate place for you than in the basement, so that's, uh, that's actually quite good. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I enjoy the basement. You know, never too hot, never too cold down here. So, um, But, uh, hey, working on some big deals. Had some big deals come across the plate, and uh, – Man, I am super friggin' excited about um, our new group coaching program. Uh, the Land the, MBA. Exactly. 
where we hold nothing back like some others. Uh, and we are fully, we are completely sold out uh, for our uh, September cohort starting uh, August 30th. And then, uh, yeah, we're oversubscribed, taking... I should say. Oversubscribed. Exactly. We, we let a couple of extra people in. Um, and then we're, we're taking, uh, we're taking applications and interviews for the October, um, cohort. And, uh, we say, we say interviews cause it, it, we don't work with anybody. We, we, we want to interview you as much as you want to interview us to make sure there's a good fit and, and you're going to be a person who's going to be successful in our program. Yeah. And I think, I think, so, you know, as they say, I think size matters. <laughs> and, and when I say size matters, it means, you know, not too big, not too small, you know, a little bit of the three, the three bearers here, right? So uh, I think there's real, what we're finding already is that there's just real value in, in group coaching because uh, the, the different people in the group feed off each other and they bring different knowledge and different experiences to the table. Um, this, the group this, that we're going to be starting here in, in early September, I mean, really smart, smart people with some really interesting backgrounds, all different. You know, they're already they're already asking very different kinds of questions, and so when you get in the group, one person asks a question, and then you think, "Oh man, that was a great question. Why did I think to ask that?" But fortunately, somebody else did. So there's actually a, more value than I think a lot of times in the in the one to one. Um, but you don't want to make it so large that you know people are not getting the personal attention that they need. So you know, our goal in this group coaching is to is to maximize the value to the students. So uh, a group of a certain size does that, and above that size, it starts to detract a little bit. So we're going to keep our, our groups on the smaller side, which means these things are going to fill up pretty fast. So if this is something you think that you're interested in, you really like to take your business, you'd like to get into the business or take your business to the next level, uh, please uh, set up a call with us. We want to talk to you. We want to find out what you're trying to accomplish, what you're all about, and whether this is going to be a good fit for you. And if it is, we want to get you slotted in there before these things fill up because they are filling up already quite quickly. And to get on our schedule, they go to the complicated web address of land.mba. So I'll never remember that. Talk about <laughs> that first call, Howard, talking to sellers. Oh my gosh. First of all, if you are a person who's not particularly comfortable getting on the phone with a bunch of strangers, you are not alone. But the good news is don't worry about it because this is a learned skill. Practice, practice, practice. And when you get the good results that you get from it, you will be so motivated. You know, that phone will ring. You'll be looking forward to those calls. Um, I want to tell a quick story from my last corporate job. Uh, I had a marketer over in our London office and as part of his personal development, we gave him a task of talking to five customers per week. That wasn't a task to call five customers a week. He had to talk to five customers per week, no matter how many calls that would entail to make those five conversations happen. And he was, it, it was so far out of his comfort zone. I think the guy was like ready to break out in the hives at the idea of having to cold call somebody. Um, but the problem for a marketer is that if you don't have that direct customer contact and you're in a meeting trying to figure out what to do and the guy next to you is a sales guy who talks to customers all day long, the sales guy is always going to win the argument. You never will because they've got credibility because my customer said this or my customer said that. Now, remember, salespeople play a, a very vital role in the company, but they're also transactional. They're going to they're going to say, I need this right now so I can close this deal so I can get my commission. A marketer comes at it and says, look, I'm not trying to solve a specific customer problem. I'm trying to solve a market problem. And you can't win the argument if you can't speak to the market, which means you are listening to your customers. So anyway, we put this on him. He was really, really uncomfortable with it. Within three to four weeks, he was probably talking to 10 customers a week. He couldn't get enough of it. He was devouring it because he immediately experienced the power that it gave him and the confidence it gave him in all situations to say, look, at, I understand what the market wants because I've in the last three weeks, I've talked to 40 different customers. 
And now everybody's listening to him and, and the salespeople are listening to him, learning things as well. It was very powerful. So once you start experiencing a little success, this, I promise you, you're going to get more comfortable and you're going to eat it up. You're going to love it. So don't worry about that. Um, yeah, exactly. I remember early on in my sales career, uh, same thing. Cause I, I started with an engineering background and, um, you know, I was, um, and, and, and there's a lot of engineering types, data types, um, finance types that are drawn to this business because of the numbers. And uh, there's there's definitely an analytical side for sure. When, you know, preparing mailers and analyzing uh, deals and, and, and analyzing, you know, the numbers and statistics on, on, on evaluating a new area, et cetera. Uh, and a lot of those people, I mean, this is a stereotype, but it's pretty true uh, in that a lot of people with those type of profiles are not necessarily uh, naturally uh, salespeople. And, and even though you're, this is on the buy side, it's sales, it's persuasion, it's building relationships and, and then persuading someone to do what you want them to do. So it's, it's sales, whether you're buying or selling. And, um, but the good news on that is anybody can learn it. Now, somebody who you call a, you know, I, I, I don't believe there are natural born salespeople. Uh, there are people who have a more natural profile for talking with people and whatnot. And, and their 10 is here and your 10 is here on a scale of one to 10, but it doesn't matter. You're going to, if, if you suck at it and hate it, you can still develop the skill to where it's plenty good enough to close yeah. a lot of deals in this business. It is a learned skill. And so it's just, it takes practice, you know? So one of the things that I like to do is put a mirror on my desk. Um, and because it, it, it helps you with your confidence, sit up, you know, even if you, if, you know, we're all working from home these days, but even if it's a, if it's a corporate job and you're working in your pajamas and you're talking to people, um, if there's a really important call, you know, first of all, you want to get yourself prepared, but practicing, do some role play with yourself in a mirror, do some role play with another person and just get more confident. Think of some of the possible objections and role play with somebody, but have that mirror up when you're on the phone talking to them. And so that you, because your body language, if you're slouching, it projects in your voice. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're sitting up tall and, you know, attentive, and, you know, you might want to shave. I should need to, you know, you might want to put a nice shirt on if that helps your psyche, if that whatever helps your confidence, ladies, uh, you know, you're used to working from home and you're not zooming, you're just on the call. So you're not putting any makeup on, put some makeup on if that helps you feel better and feel more confident about yourself. All of those little things are just little, little nuances that can help you. You feel better about getting and more confident getting on the phone with somebody. You know, that's something that Tony Robbins talks about a lot. He talks about the power of physiology and how getting yourself in the right, um, getting your body in the right situation changes how you think and feel in, in your emotional state. So, you know, he talks about, you know, put on your, your Superman or your Superwoman pose, you know, stand up straight, put your shoulders back, put a big smile on your face. And, and it literally changes how you feel. Um, if you're going into a call and you're feeling like, I don't know if I can do this, I don't know if I'm going to be good. You're right. It's going to come across in your voice. It's going to make you a little less confident and just getting the words out. Think about all the time, you know, that, you know, you're just um, amongst your friends. You're in a completely relaxed environment and you're like, oh, the words just flow out. You're funny and charming and you know, all those things. And then, you know, another time, maybe you're like in the presence of the CEO of your company and you're like feeling a little intimidated and all of a sudden your voice goes up a little bit higher and you don't quite in the words just don't seem to show up in your head anymore because you're not feeling as confident. Get, you know, get yourself in the right headspace. And in fact, I would argue that, you know, the, the few minutes, maybe even 10 minutes before a call are absolutely critical to your success to get your head in the right space to take that call. Um, 
and that that that's a few things one is just your confidence it's just getting getting straight up you know getting getting yourself in the right uh posture and 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 and, and put a smile on your face maybe put the right clothes on but the other thing is to understand what the purpose of that call is and to remind yourself what the purpose of that call is dave we're in business and our, we're in the business of making money is that the purpose of this call well ultimately but we have to remember that we're providing a service because if it's always all about the money that's going to come through especially to a seller that you're making a a, a fairly low offer to um and so you just have to remember that you're there to serve them and to provide value um not just to you know not to trick them or not to you know just to make money off of them because that's that's not what we're doing at the end of the day uh we're we're providing a value whether it's simplicity and um you know are, are they happen to get our letter at good timing when they need some money um or they're just they're just kind of done with dealing with the property maybe they've Maybe they've called some realtors who aren't interested in selling it because it's out in the middle of nowhere, um, whatever. And they, they, but you're providing a service to them. Uh, they're in a situation where they'd like to sell it. That's right. Um, Completely in the service business. And I, I get this from a lot of people I talk to all the time over the last several years, you know, people coming into the business, it's like it feels a little bit, you know, not so great. I mean, we're offering 20 cents on the dollar. We're offering these really low ball offers. It feels like maybe we're trying to take advantage of people. Not at all. No, we are in order for our business model to work. We're looking for distressed opportunities. Distressed people need solutions. We are providing a solution that makes sense for them at that time in the context of what makes sense for us. It's as simple as that. If you send out a hundred letters and your letters are 20 cents on the dollar and 98% of the people that receive those letters either don't get back to you or want to tell you how much they don't like you and, or your offer and what you can do with it. All that means is they're not your customer, but the two people who do call you are distressed. And if those deals happen, I assure you in a free market, in a free market system, there's only one reason a deal happens, and that is because they're in an exchange of value in which both people are getting what they want and what they need. So you can know that if they're doing the deal, it's because they're getting what they need. You are solving a problem for them. And that is our job. Our job is to find the people who have the need and solve the problem. And that's what we're doing. And if you understand that, you'll feel really good about it because it's good to solve people's problems. It feels good. Um, so go in and know that when you get on that call, it's not about making money. Making money is, is secondary. It is the byproduct of providing good service to people. And, and if you know that and you get your head straight, then it becomes all about them and not about you. And that will come through both verbally, but also non-verbally. They will feel that from you. Feel understood. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to get into that in some more depth. Uh, we're going to we're going to talk about, you know, how our first goal when the caller calls is to triage them. We're going to and how the callers fall into three different categories. Before we do that, uh, I'd like to hear from a word from our sponsor, Landspeed. Hey, folks, people often talk about automating and outsourcing your land flipping business. But what does that really mean? Generic solutions leave it to you to figure out how to set up and maintain the automations. I've been running my land business on land speed for over three years because it's a total solution and allows me to focus on being a great land investor. Land speed was built specifically for land investing by a land investor. And with many of the most successful people in the business using it for years, it's evolved into one of the most feature rich solutions on the market. Some of the key benefits I get are being able to create and manage mail campaigns and neighbor letters. I'm able to automate tasks amongst my team, create contracts and deeds, and email, text, or mail them within a few clicks. I can automatically capture sales leads from any lead source, including Facebook Messenger. Then it automatically pushes those leads into my sales funnel so that 
I can manually follow up, but they also go into my automated drip campaign. And since LandSpeed's a total cloud-based solution, I can run my business from anywhere in the world with a phone, laptop, or tablet. So if you want to turn your hobby into a professional, scalable business, just go to landspeedtech.com forward slash Dave to receive a $150 discount today. So Howard, how do, yes, we, triage, sir. How do we triage a seller and figure out which of the three categories they're in? Tell us about that. Yeah. So, so I like to, I, I like to create some process. It just makes my life easier. And, and so when calls come in, I immediately within like the first three to five seconds, I put them into one of three buckets. Either they're calling me because they hate my offer and consequently hate me and want to tell me exactly where I can put my offer. Okay, probably not even going to get on the phone with them because I, I kind of screen them out ahead of times, but sometimes they squeak through. Uh, and so that's the let, first group. Let me stop you right there. I just want to interject something. Uh, for those of you who are new and you're just starting to see some, some leads come in from sellers, uh, it's don't be afraid to call some of those those people, those angry people back uh, because it's good practice. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know, it, it's like your first call comes in and it's a potential deal and you screw it up because you're so nervous. Right. Practice on those on those screw you calls. Um, call them back. I, I just was having this with um, one of my students. Um, and she got her first reply off her mailer. First, well, there was about three that we evaluated together. And these weren't uh, hostile calls. These were probably more in the middle, but uh, there was enough evidence there to, to suggest that, you know, they're, they're not going to be deals. But I still, we, we evaluated them and I gave her some instructions on, you know, maybe what you want to talk about. But I had her call them back anyway, just for practice so that when that deal comes in, She's going to be a little bit sharper, sharper on one edge of that knife. Absolutely. Yeah. A call is a call is a call. It's an opportunity and uh, we have to handle every situation. So, so group one, I hate you. I hate your offer. And I want to tell you what you can do with it. Group two is, Hey, I got your letter. This looks interesting. Can you tell me more about it? That is a potential deal in the making. Right. And the third group is uh, everybody else. They're kind of in the, the in-betweeners. They're like, yeah, what is this all about? I don't, uh, I don't know you. I didn't ask for this. How did you get my name? So they're not completely rude, and it's not clear whether there's an opportunity there or not. So you might have to work a little bit harder on those. And yeah. each one of those, once you, once you put them in the appropriate bucket, now we can establish an appropriate strategy of how to deal with each of those types of calls. Right. Right. And that third bucket can be all over the board. You know? Yeah. It, it, yeah. It could lead to a screw you. It could lead to, a, oh, yeah, I'll sell to you for what you're offering. But uh, so let's let's come back to this. You're on the second one, right? Um, well, the first one is we hate your offers, right? Yeah. And then we're OK with your offer. Want to discuss. So if you get them into that bucket where they're, you know, you know that, oh, I hate you. I hate your offer. Dave, what is your objective on that phone call? to get them off the phone as soon as possible or off the phone. Yeah. I mean, uh, on a rare occasion, you might turn them, but that's going to be really rare. So essentially, uh, you know, usually they, they are going to be, if you give them a phone with them, I mean, usually it's going to be a message that gets taken, but if you happen to pick up the phone, um, just be polite and um, say, so, okay. So you, uh, you didn't like our offer. Uh, I mean, you might come back and say, uh, you, you could come back and say, so if the offer were more, were closer to what you'd like to see for the property, are, do you have something, uh, do you have some interest in selling? And then if they said yes, uh, then you'd say, well, you know, do you have a number in mind? And uh, you know, usually people say, well, why don't you make me a better offer? Yeah, right. And uh, that's, that's pretty low. You know, you might just, and it, it really depends. I mean, you may take a quick glance at it and realize, holy cow, boy, was I way off. And then that might change the situation, but you really don't want to spend a lot of time on that. 
And time is comes- our most valuable commodity. And uh, if something looks like it's going to be a dead end, just cut bait, get them move off on, put your time where it's going to matter. Say, well, hey, I really appreciate your call. Sorry uh, that our solution is going to work for you. But if you change your mind, you know where to find us. And so but keep I, it polite. I think the uh, what you, what the way you're describing it, David, is is exactly right. Is that just because people are rude to us doesn't mean we should be rude to them. So uh, always always be professional, always be polite. You never know when it, you know something's going to come back around, and there may be another opportunity. And frankly, why not put good out in the universe? You know, I've got a very good friend, and he he gave me one of my rules for life, which is never let somebody else's smallness be an excuse for your own. So they want to be a jerk, let them be a jerk. That doesn't mean we have to be jerks. Yeah. And hey, look, I have had one deal over the years. Uh, I had somebody call me back two years later after they after they told me to pound sand. Um, and I did a deal with them because the, their life situation had changed. Yeah. And that's what this is about. It's not about the asset. It's about the person's situation. Right. That's right. All right. The second uh, category are people who may be quite interested in your offer. They, they give you that. So you put them in that bucket, and now we have to figure out how to deal with them. What is the most important thing we do and the first thing we do with those kinds of people, David? Well, the first thing you got to realize is they, they may be sitting on five letters and you were first on the stack to call, right? And so they may have other, other offers. And, um, you know, we've always talked about no like, and trust. First, you get them to like you because as you've said, all things being equal, you know, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're going to do business with people they like. So you got to build rapport. Um, and how do you build rapport? Um, you know, don't just start talking about the deal. Um, you, you might, you know, they, they may call you and ask you, so, you know, tell me, what, what are you doing? What's this about? How do you know about my property? How'd you get my information? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, I am interested in selling. And instead of just going in and talking about the property and the numbers in the process, say, hey, you know, um, just out of curiosity, where are you calling from? And, and, and get that conversation going. Oh, you're calling from California. Oh gosh, I used to live in California. What part? And, and then you, you get, you get a little bit, you get sidetracked a little bit. You might, that might lead into a little bit about family and whatnot and, and, and listen a lot and then ask questions about them, getting, get them talking about themselves and their situation because people don't know how care how much, you know, until they know that you care, right? This shows that you care about them, it, it humanizes you. It drops their guard down a little bit because even though they're interested in selling, they're that 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 person that that wants to sell. Um, they don't know you from Adam. They they see you. They know you from the, the letter. Maybe looked you up on the internet, but they don't know that you're a real person. They don't know if you're a company of two or two hundred. And now, so you get that conversation, build a rapport, and they start to like you, and then you you continue that conversation and that builds that builds trust yep. and confidence there's that old adage in sales that uh, all things being equal people would rather do business with people they like yep. and all things not being equal people would rather do business with people they like yep. so building that rapport is the foundation for trust and relationship and and i've seen it time and time again is sometimes you don't people will say i'm not going for the best offer i'm going for the best offer from the person i like or trust the most and i and i actually usually talk about that is you know I'll, because we know we know they're in, in in this day and age they're getting multiple letters so you know i'll talk about that i'll say you know you've got to really consider not just what the offer is but you got to know who you're doing business with you don't want to do business with just anybody because we're talking about something worth hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of dollars. And you want to make sure that, you know, you're doing business with a person who you trust and, and believe will, will deal with you honestly. And, uh, and uh, that's a way to differentiate yourself just by saying that. Um, and so, yeah, spot on, Dave. Um, I always start, you know, saying, hey, so where are you from? 
you know, some a simple question like that can lead to a lot of things. Oh, you're from Texas. Oh, have you ever been to Franklin's Barbecue down in Austin? I love that place. You know, what, whatever it is that you're going to say, because what you really want to do is you want to humanize yourself. Like David said, I mean, they don't know whether you're a one person shop or a 2000 person shop. Um, all they know is you're a company and they got a letter from you. Uh, but people want to do business with business with people. We, we say this all the time. And we said this in the, in the B2B world, the business to business world, you know, you could be doing business with IBM or, or GM or whoever, but at the end of the day, when a sale is made, it's between two human beings. And that's true here as well, too. So you have to humanize yourself and make them make yourself into a person that they're going to want to do business with. Um, and if you can do that, you can definitely get the deal. All right. So we've built the rapport. And now we're actually, oh, one last thing I, I want to mention about that is so a lot of times people will get on these calls and they're not comfortable either. I mean, maybe they're not comfortable getting on the phone, talking to a bunch of strangers. And when that happens, people can come across very harsh and very, you know, all mall business. And they get right into the questions like your offer is low. Why, why is your offer lower? Whatever they're going to say. And they, they might ask some questions. And remember this, it's not their call. It's your call. Now, we always want to be polite. We always want to, you know, maybe even give them the, the feeling that they're in charge, but they're not in charge. You are. And so if somebody says that, says, oh, well, what about the price or what about blah, blah, blah. I said, those, those, are, those are really, really good questions. We need to talk about all of those. But before we get into that, I'm just curious, where are you from? <laughs> Take control back. You, t you guide the conversation. They will follow. I promise you that. Yeah, yeah in a respectful way because it's your call but it's about them right it's always 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 about them so we can figure out because it's they're they're on that call to figure out what's in it for them right and 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 we always have to remember that we are providing a service and so have that attitude of a servant of service and, and that's going to help carry your conversation to be about them. And so, you know, that leads into, uh, you know, even more curiosity. As we're asking questions, we listen and we learn, and that's going to spur more questions. And that's all a part, you know, of that uh, rapport building part. Uh, and, and, and in that conversation, you know, we may find something that we've a thread that we have in common and we go down a little rabbit trail on that. And so they start to, Oh, I like this guy. I can, I can, I can, I can, you know, I want to talk further with him, but I want to figure out if I trust him. Still, mm -hmm. I like him. Don't know if I trust him. And that's where, you know, you probe and ask more questions, use your ears and, and mouth proportionately, you know, asks, you know, poignant questions and listen and get them talking. And let's face it, we, we, we send out a lot of mail. And so our knowledge of any of these properties at the time the call happens is usually fairly cursory. We haven't done our due diligence yet, at least not a full due diligence. And so in a lot of ways, this call is the first step of due diligence. We're going to, we want to learn some things uh, because if we're going to go to the next step, we want to make sure it's a property we're really interested in just so so it really is this this is about two people coming together deciding if they want to move forward it's not just about do they want to sell it's also do you want to buy and you're going to figure that out by asking questions but in the process of asking questions you're getting them to talk about themselves and what does everybody love to talk about most in the world themselves so it actually, it works perfectly. And you ask, you know, why, you know, why, how did you get the property? Why are you selling the property? You know, why are you interested in selling the property? Um, you know, does the property have access Does you know, what, whatever it is. I mean, it's a combination of specifics about the property and also what their motivations are. Um, all very, very useful things to decide how you're going to carry forward uh, with, with this opportunity. Right. Now, we're going to, we're going to talk in detail uh, about closing later, but it, in this process here, where we're building that rapport, we're gonna we're gonna get to a point in this conversation with this person who uh, is is who is open to selling. As we're building this rapport, we're building the, tr the the know, like, and trust. At some point, we're gonna get to a point where 
we're going to need to steer the conversation back to, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the property now, because you want to, you're going to, the third step in this is you're going to tell them about how the process works. Um, but you, you have to know a little bit about the property also that you maybe could know from taking the cursory look. And remember, it's, people are busy these days. It's really difficult to get them back on the phone. So if they're interested um, and, you know, you want to try to get them closed and get that signed purchase agreement, but you've got to know a little bit about the property that's going to really help. It's going to save you a lot of time if you can get the information from them, you know, such as the, 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 the few due diligence questions like, you know, access uh, attributes, you know, you know, just have you done any improvements to the property? Is there a well? Things like that that are in your due diligence. Um, what else? What am I missing here? Um, well, all, all of that. We don't have to get into all the due diligence kinds of questions that we might ask, but this is a good time to ask those questions. So it's a combination of questions about the property and also questions about how they about themselves. How do they come to get the property? What do they? You know, why do they want to sell the property? And you know, are are they are is their name on the deed? You know, is there anybody else's name on the deed? You know, right. things like that. Does the it does the has the property been through a probate? <laughs> right. Excuse me. And, and those and when we ask them about attributes and things like that, okay, so so it has county, it's on a county maintained road or just a little two track, does it have power, uh, does it have utilities nearby, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk through some of that stuff and, you know, let's say your offer was on the low side um, and um, that's when, when those answers are no, it's not on a county maintained road. No, it doesn't have power. No, it doesn't have this or that. Just in having a conversation in, in their mind, that's going, that, that, that's a way to rationalize uh, the offer. Right. And so uh, anyway, without having to say anything, you're just going to say, OK, 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 and, and, and leave it at that. Now, if it comes to the point where you got to negotiate, then 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 you can tie your your argument back to the lack of attributes. Um, so, yeah, so so. So your first goal here is uh, is to build a rapport. Second goal is to be curious and ask lots of questions. Make sure you take good notes because you talk to a lot of people in this business. And when you come back to this person, you may not remember this conversation. So make sure you take notes. Always good to have a good CRM system to put those notes into. Uh, a little plug for land speed, recommend it highly. Uh, and then third, uh, before you get off the phone, what you want to do is you want to let them know what the process is going forward. Create the proper expectations so that they feel like they are, they know what what's going to happen. People don't like not knowing what's going to happen. They don't like it when they're when proper expectations have not been set. So you know it'd be something like, well, this is great. Well, I've taken, I've got my notes here. Everything looks very interesting. I'm very interested in your property. It sounds like you know. Let me just verify you, that you 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 think you'd like to sell it. Yes, great. My next step is I'm going to go through what we call due diligence, where we're going to go into depth as far as looking at um, chain of title and liens and all, all the kind of things that we have to do to make sure that this is a, a good property, safe property to buy. I'm sure it's fine, but look, we got to go through the process. And uh, that usually takes about a week. I'll be back in touch with you and, uh, and then we'll be ready to move forward and get some money in your pocket. Yeah, but you, you, there's one, one step you missed there that's very, very clear. We do not spend time not one minute of time until we have a signed purchase agreement. Very so good point, right? You gotta make it say, so once we have a signed purchase agreement from you, then we'll go into these things that Howard mentioned in step three. Right, very good, good catch. Again, it comes back to your time, protect your time, uh, because you could waste time doing due diligence and whatnot. I mean, other than your five minute look up, right? And you're gonna do that typically before you call them. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to spend. You're wasting time if if you're if you spend any time on due diligence and 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 looking up that kind of stuff if without a signed purchase agreement. Very very good point. All right. So the third group. So we've covered. We hate your offer. We've covered. We like your offer. And now it's the group in the middle. We don't quite know where they stand. We don't know if they're interested. They 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 might. They're not being completely rude, but they're not being completely friendly. Um, so 
how do we so i guess I, I, our first goal here is just to feel them out a little bit and find out you know are they in one of the first two camps or you know is there is there a possibility that we can make something happen here um and so it really kind of comes back to the same theme we've been talking about is we have to get them talking I still, yeah. you know, I would still argue it's 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 the same first two steps. One, build rapport. Um, you know, they might not be quite as friendly at the beginning, but that doesn't mean you can't generate some friendliness. And it's just easy with these simple front end questions. You know, where are you from? You know, what uh, wh whatever it is, um, find something in common with them that you can just relate to a little bit. I've done I've done crazy things like you know, uh, <laughs> I'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you just hold on one second? Blah, blah, blah. And I'll just and I'll come back and say, oh, yeah, my sorry, I'm standing on my deck and my dog just went screaming after 10 wild turkeys on my property. It was hilarious. You know, I say stupid stuff like that just because it humanizes me and it sets them at ease a little bit. And then we can we can start to build a little bit of relationship because I want to get it. I don't want to get start, you know, all business and all serious in any conversation if I can avoid it. So yeah. that that's still probably where you want to start. I, I think it is those 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 steps one and two, you know, and, and they're really one uh, building rapport, but it's it's rapport and then taking rapport to a deeper level. Rapport is always, uh, you know, when, if somebody's on the fence like that, you know, they're 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 interested, but they're apprehensive. They don't like the price. Uh, the thing is, you may not close them. You may not turn them and close them today. Mm -hmm. But you might tomorrow, tomorrow meaning in the future someplace. All right. So you always, always, there, it's never wasted time to build rapport. And then, you know, you, you may or may not have a follow-up sequence for that, for that person. Uh, those are deals that if, if I'm not able to close them today, I don't mark them dead. I have another category called back burner. And those are ones that, you know, may possibly be that they're worth following up on in the future because you might, you know, and you might set up a text message system. You may send them another letter. You may, you know, email them or call them here or there, uh, however you want to set that up. But um, anyway, so let's come back to the, you know, building that rapport. And then as far as the, the negotiation, it's usually about price as to why, you know, the, you know, they want to negotiate. And uh, a, a good question is, let me ask you something. If, uh, if it's about price, um, do you have a number in mind? You know, um, if we can, if we can get to a price that's within reason for you, are you interested in selling? And, and so once you hear that, yeah, I mean, if that's a no, then it's going to be like like the first scenario, and you want to get them off the phone. Um, yeah, you know, there's a yes. Continue down. Oh, sorry, Dave. Yeah, there's hey. um, there are people, and and we could claim this for ourselves too, that believe that at some level every conversation is a negotiation. It's a it's an element of the negotiation, and you might say, well, that sounds a little bit contradictory with this idea that we're you know it's all about service and it's all about them, but there is always in the background this this idea of price discovery where like i said we're trying to find that exchange of value it's got to be the right value for me it's got to be the right value for them so to some some level there is also this negotiation that's going on now some people on the other side especially in this category the somewhere in the middle category they're coming in and they're negotiating right off the bat mm -hmm. we don't like your price okay well you know that they're not saying I don't want to sell you the property. They're just saying they don't like our price. Okay. So I actually take a slightly different uh, approach uh, than, than David does. Um, I don't ask them what price they want ever. I don't care. I know what I'm willing to pay. So what I, what I typically do is I, I would say something like, and I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. This is just my approach. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I would say, let me ask you a question. Let's just say that you and I could come together on price. We could find a price that was mutually agreeable. Are you even interested in selling the property? And if they say, well, not really, I, I want the property. I'm like, well, and I completely respect that. It's your property. I mean, we don't have to carry on the conversation if you're not looking to sell it. I mean, keep my name, you know, maybe, maybe in the future. 
But if they say, yes, I would be interested in selling the property, then I say, well, in that case, I think we've got the basis of a deal here. We just haven't found the price yet. And, and then I usually explain my business model. I said, look, I'm an investor and I buy properties and I sell properties. And obviously I have to make some money on the property and I can't do that if I'm playing full retail. Now, if you want to make full retail on your property, you're going to have to either you know hire a realtor and pay the commission if 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 there's a realtor that would do that small of a property, or you know you're going to have to figure out how to market it and sell it yourself if you've got the time and, and and knowledge of how to do that, and that's completely up to you. It's your property, but if that's not in your comfort zone, um, that's where I come in and I can help with that. But I've got to make money on this deal, and or, or else you know I've got to look at other opportunities. So. It is possible, and it, it's very, in fact, very possible that the initial price that we put on our letter to you is not, does not accurately represent the value of your property. And I'll tell you why, because we sent a lot of letters out and, and, and frankly, you know, we're kind of doing a back of the envelope in our initial assessment, but sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes, you know, we, we give the same price to a property that's, you know, uh, inland versus a, a property that's lakefront. You know, because we haven't captured all the information into the model because we didn't have it. So what I can do for you is I can take this back to my team and we can do a deep dive on it and we can get you a price that I think really is representative of your specific property. But I don't want to do this if you're not really serious about selling because that's a lot of work for us. And, and I'm going to be asking more of you too. And, and there's no reason to waste all of our time if you're not serious. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. That's a great, great approach. Yeah. And I'm so, forcing them. I'm forcing them to say, yes, I want to sell it. And yes, I'm serious. And yeah. people, there's something innate inside of people. They want to be consistent with their word. And so by making them do that, we, we now have at least the foundation to go forward. And he knows, he knows he's going to still get a low ball offer because I have to make money. And he's still right. saying, yes, go ahead and do it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so perfect uh, transition into, you know, a couple of objections. So, all right, Howard, what are you going to do with the property? Yeah. Well, I am, uh, I'm, I'm an investor. And um, on the one hand, I try to help people get rid of properties that they no longer want and convert it into cash in their pocket. On the other hand, I'm helping people find properties who want them. Uh, I, you know, I service both sides of that equation. Yeah, I love that answer. Uh, another answer that I use sometimes is, well, you know, what we do is is we like to um, make it easy for people to buy properties by selling it to them with seller financing. We get we take properties off of people like your hands who no longer want the property and and don't have the the means to sell them, and uh, and we. We make it easy for for people to buy with seller financing. So we just put a little markup on it, and we make our money over time on interest. Right. So that's another Great. another way. Fantastic. So they, because people don't want to feel you know they know that you're an investor and they know that you need to make some money, but they 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 don't want to feel taken advantage of like they're really getting the short end of the stick. Um, yeah. And, you're, and you're speaking of that, off of them. Speaking of that, the other uh, objection that we might hear is. You know, I get a lot of letters asking about my property and some of them are offering a lot more money than you are. Why should I go with you? How do yeah, you answer that one? And that's a really common one these days. You know, well, hopefully you've built that rapport already. If you ha if that happens in the beginning of the conversation, you do what we, we talked about. It's like, great question. Love to answer that. But first of all, let me ask you where you're calling from, right? So if it's the beginning of the question, get back there, diffuse it, build a rapport, get them to like you. And now you can come back and ask them, well, do you, we've had a nice conversation. Uh, do you think I'd be a, a, a good person to do business with? You know, and that, that answer is hopefully yes. So there's there's one reason you should do business with me. I'm, uh, uh, we, we've built some rapport and, 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 uh, I, you know, I think I'm a, I'm a trustworthy person. I'm going to do what I say, when I say it and how I say it. Um, 
the other thing, you know, let's say they talk about, they, they say, well, you know, some of the offers I've received are higher than yours. And, you know, one of the things I uh, try to explain to them is like, I said, well, you know, if in, in my business model, I know what I can pay and this is, this is what I can pay. If somebody has offered you significantly more, then, you know, you should take those offers. Uh, but one thing I would caution you about is that there are a lot of new people in this business that sometimes, and we do it too, and we're not new, but sometimes you go into a new area and you misprice the area. Sometimes you misprice it high, sometimes you misprice it low. But then when those, you know, when the, the, those, those offers, they may not close on that property at that price because um, once they look at it and do some due diligence, they're going to realize that they offered you too much money and then they're going to try to walk back their offer. Exactly. Exactly. And when that happens, I'm still here. Give me a call. We'll, we'll work something out. Or, you know, if you don't want to go through all that rigmarole, 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 rigmarole <laughs> let's just, let's just, you know, do business let's, with someone that you it. like right now. Let's just, you know, let's do it. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, those are just two objections. There's probably more. And as you go through this and take more calls, you'll you'll come up. Make a keep, always make a list of the objections, so that you know you you got that running list and know what your standard answers are, and uh, and you'll be ready for them. You'll never be caught off guard. I um when I was uh, when I finished school, uh, gra graduate school, I. Uh, I was trying to get a job and I didn't know how to get a job because I had never had to do it before. I was in the military and I'd never really had to get a job before. So here I am in my thirties for the first time in my life having to get a job. And uh, I just, I, I finally, with the help of a good friend of mine, who's quite brilliant in this area, I figured out how to get interviews. And now I called him up and I'm like, John, I got the interview. What do I do now? And then he, he was instructing me on how to handle the interview. And he said, and I won't go too long into the story, but he said, Howard, most people will tell you that, or he said, what's the most common question people ask? I don't know. He said, they're going to ask you, so tell me about yourself. And the reason they ask that question is for two reasons. One is because they're really lazy and they want you to do all the work. And the other is because they don't really know what they're doing. And so they want you to do all the work. So uh, it's the most common question. And what most pros will tell you is you have to answer it with the two minute drill. It's a very kind of a two minute succinct elevator pitch on who you are, ending it on kind of an open ended thing, which, you know, allows them to carry the conversation on. He said, don't do that. He said, your answer to that question should be no less than 17 minutes long. He said, what you have to do is you have to tell the story of Howard. And it can't be a documentary or a chronology. It has to be like a made for TV movie with humor and drama. And at the end, you know, they, you know, they've got to come to a climax and the hairs on uh, going up on the back of their neck saying, what happens? What happens? Now you'll write that whole story out. And then what you'll do is you'll, they'll ask a question and you'll just cherry pick a piece from that story. And you don't have to tell the whole story at once and you don't have to tell it in order because once you have the story, you'll find that there's nothing that they can ask you that you don't already have the answer for. You just picked a little cherry picked little pieces out of your story. And that's what we're talking about here in the preparation. Once you have some preparation for these calls, you don't say it all at once, no matter what they throw at you, you just cherry pick because it's in your head. You already know the answers. You're ready to go. You're so smooth. You never say, Oh, um, I'll have to get back to you. It's always right there. And then, then you're going to have this incredible supreme confidence on this call. And when you've got the supreme confidence in your content, then you could put much, much more energy in the relationship and rapport building. Right. I love that. I love that. So that's awesome. So let's move into a couple of closing lines. Um, you know, there's the, you know, you've had a good conversation and you pretty much got the feeling that this person's ready to go and you make the assumptive close. Um, tell us how you do the, the assumptive close, Howard. Um, I would say something like, all right, fantastic. Hey, it has been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for your time. If, you know, if I'm un understanding things correctly, you know, you want to sell this property and I can assure you that I'd like to buy it. So the next steps are boom, 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 boom. 
Yep. All I need you to do is sign that purchase agreement. All I need you to do is sign that purchase agreement. Right. <laughs> and you want to make it as easy as possible. You just tell them, hey, if you got it sitting there, uh, sign it, uh, take a picture of it and text it to me. I go. can work from that. I mean, um, I mean, hell, I've opened up escrow from a freaking bar napkin before, seriously, on a house. Um, we got all the cleaned up contracts from the title company, but, you know, we, we it's, uh, you just get them, get that freaking signed agreement. And then the next one is the seller's a little bit hesitant, you know, um, I would, well, you you've got mixed feelings, you know, you think, you think they're ready to go, but you're not sure. Um, but you know, you've, you've talked about all their objections. You've, you've covered all the objections in a, in a good way um, to where you felt like they were okay with your answers. And you might say something like, so um, Howard, um, we've, you, you asked me about this, you, uh, uh, you know, we, we talked about the price, we talked about the different uh, attributes of the property, we talked about why um, you might want to do business with our company. Um, you, you seemed satisfactory with, with those answers. So at this point, is there anything that would prevent you from moving forward? And, yep. you know, you've already covered their objections. You just reiterated that you covered their objections. And then you, you're pretty much asking them anything else that would prevent you from moving forward. So um, if they say no, then they need a little more selling. It's not no, it just means they're not, they're not sold yet. And then you have to dive back into that conversation as right. to, well, you know, what, wh what can I tell you, you know, uh, what do you need to know from me? And then it's, you, you dive so, back into the conversation. Just a variation on a theme, because I think that's exactly correct, but it's just a variation on the theme uh, would be something like, so, so, you know, we've covered a lot of things today. Uh, and so on a scale of one to 10, how, how confident are you that you want to move forward with a deal to sell your property to us? That's a good one. That's, that's a good and one. And if they say a six or a seven or a two, it doesn't matter what they say. What gets you it's to All you're ten. doing is you're setting up the second question is, what would it take to get that to a 10? Yep. 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 So there's, there's a lot of different ways or there's multiple ways to, to kind of ask the same thing. And, uh, and, and those things take, you know, as you practice, they're going to be more, um, more fluid. And, um, so it just, uh, it's, it's really more art than science. <laughs> um, there's a little science to it, but it's more art. And, uh, and at the end of the day, it's about a relationship. It's about building relationships with people and just having a conversation. And if it doesn't go well, don't beat yourself up. <laughs> There's only two kinds of experiences, good experiences <laughs> and learning experiences. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. Don't beat yourself up. Just, you know, take notes, you know, afterwards. Uh, I mean, I, I try to evaluate every call whether it went good or bad, you know, what, what, what went good, what went, what went bad, what could I have done better? Yeah. Um, things like that. And you just work on, on, on improving that, that craft. And at some point you get to a point where you can wing it. So all right, let's, 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 let's put a little nice bow on this package. Yeah. All right. So first thing, it's all about them. Get your head straight before you get on the call. We are in the service business. We are here to solve their problem. We're not here to make money. Money is a byproduct of us doing a good job by solving of solving their problem. Second, really on almost any circumstances, it's all about building some rapport so that we can turn that into trust and relationship and become the kind of a person that they want to do a deal with. Exactly. Um, be uh, self-effacing with people who don't like your offer. You know, it takes the wind out of it. They want to, they want to be angry at you and, you know, just, just be self-effacing and say, you know what? I completely understand that, that, that offer, it, it is, it is low. You know, it's either low because that's the nature of my business or it's low because, you know, sometimes we need to go back to the drawing board and maybe take a closer look at it. If you're interested in selling it at, at the right price, I'd be happy to do that. If not, 
you know, no problem. But, you know, once you once you sort of take it upon yourself that, yeah, you know, you may, maybe maybe that is the wrong price. It takes all the wind out of their sails, takes all the hostility out of it. Um, no, uh, you're oh, I'm sorry, Dave, go ahead. No, then, you know, you want to triage the situation and get them, you know, quickly get them into the, the one of the three camps. I hate right, you. Right, right. I really do want to sell, but I have questions or kind of on the fence. Not sure if I want to sell. And then know what your strategy is for each one of those scenarios and be ready to execute. Yeah, I mean, you could probably figure out which bucket they're in in the first three to five seconds of the call and then just execute yeah. the strategy appropriately. And then be ready, be ready for the, the most common objections and, uh, and how to uh, handle those objections. And, uh, and then do not be afraid to ask for the close. Same on your sales side, but... Uh, you know, we'll go back to something I said earlier. We are busy human beings. You get someone on the phone, you don't want to let them off the phone. Uh, you, you, you want to come to some sort of an agreement and if possible, a signed purchase agreement uh, before you let them off the phone. And so um, I'll tell you, I, I, I don't, I, you know, this is wrap up, so I don't want to go too long down a rabbit trail. But I've seen this throughout my my sales career, and uh, there was a point when I was selling software uh, in inside sales, and so we were in the sales pit. So you know, you got an opportunity to hear all the people around you on conversations, and I'd hear, you know, new people come in all the time. There was there was a guy I remember I used to work with who, you know, very customer focused, but the guy should have been in customer service. He was great for follow-up. He was great building rapport. The dude couldn't close to save, save his life. You gotta be willing to ask for the close. Yep. Otherwise you've just wasted your time. Right. And, and think about it this way. If you don't close, you are not able to provide any value. Whether you're buying or you're selling. You got to close to provide value. All right. I think that's a wrap, Dave. All right. Put a bow on it. Give it a kiss. Put All it right. Tree. Hopefully this was valuable to you guys. I have a feeling you're going to go out there, knock it out of the park, and uh, we're going to have lots and lots of land millionaires. Good job. Do a All great right. job out there. Please remember, like, subscribe, comment. It really, really helps us. And we, we're so grateful uh, when you do that. So please, please take a moment to do that. And we will see you next time on the Land.MBA podcast. Adios, amigos. We hope you enjoyed this episode, had a bit of fun, and walked away with some actionable insights that you can apply to your business. Dave and I have got some great content and interviews planned, so don't forget to rate and review and, of course, subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. If we mention any interesting links or tools, you'll find them in the show notes. To learn more about Land.MBA, visit our website at, wait for it, Land.MBA. See you next time on the Land.MBA podcast.